All right, we got some questions here. They're actually coming from a, a previous year activity, actually two previous year activities, but I just took them out and I just put them in here for notes 10.5. So let's see how many of these we can do before we get tired or we no longer want to do them. Uh, so it, it wants me to take the derivative. That's what dy dx means. So number one, dy dx equals negative eight x to the negative three. All I'm doing is power rule right there, minus eight. Since they have the exponent as negative, it's fine to leave it like that. Number two, y prime, I'm gonna do a whole bunch of different. Oh, you need glasses? Is it, does it look blurry? Does it look better? When I drop down the three, the threes cancel out, and I have x squared minus one. In case you wanna see it, side note, y prime equals three x squared over three minus one. Number three, before you, before you start solving the derivative, you're not gonna use quotient rule, guys. If you have a constant in the top, do not use quotient rule. Just bring the x up. So repeat that, I'm gonna repeat that. Write that in your notes. If you have a constant in the numerator, don't use quotient, just bring the, the, the denominator up. If you have a constant in the numerator, just bring denominator up. So here we go, I'm gonna take a derivative, negative x to the negative two, and since I had a positive exponent, you're gonna write it like this, negative one over x squared. There's my derivative. Question four, rewrite it as a power, and now we're ready. One half, x to the negative half, Chavez, are you gonna count it wrong if you leave it alone like that? No, I didn't give you specific directions, but Delta Math might count it wrong if, they, if it says leave everything in positive exponents. But I'll, leave, I'll count it right. Uh, this is the best answer though. Okay, we finally get to a problem that is actually interesting uh, because all we're doing before that is just taking derivative with no application. This is an application problem. This is an example of someone who's doing uh, maybe grad school, grad school chemistry. They're, maybe they're in chemistry. Have you, do you, okay, let me just get right into it. Do you guys remember the ideal gas law from chemistry? Yeah, PV equals NRT. Do you remember that? Oh man, guys, there's certain, okay. I'm not gonna lecture. I'm not gonna tell you guys about like, but there's certain rules if you're going into science or math that we should know before we graduate, the ideal gas law is one of them, because it's the ideal gas law. Uh, there, so before you get out of high, high school, make sure you know PV equals NRT, because it's like common, it's borderline common knowledge. It's like what? I can't hear you, you're muffled. Yeah, it's like knowing what pi is. She's like asking why is it common knowledge, or knowing the speed of light, or knowing uh, Avogadro's number, like how to convert molarity to, or um, gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. There are certain things that we gotta know, guys. All right, here we go, let's read this. If a gas in a cylinder is maintained at a constant temperature, so this is constant, the pressure P is related to the volume V by a formula in the form of P equals NRT over V minus NB minus AN squared over V squared. Wow, that's fancy. In which A, B, N, and R are constants. Find dp dv. So they want to know, someone wants to know, the rate of change of pressure with respect to volume of this cylinder. That's what this means. Rate of change of pressure with respect to volume at a moment. Rate of change of pressure with respect to volume. And if you want to write the word instantaneous, you can. Instantaneous rate of change of pressure with respect to volume. So this is what you're gonna be doing when you're in grad school. And this is why it's important that you know calculus. So you can be able to do problems like this. So let's see, let's see if we can do it. P equals NRT over V minus NB minus AN squared over V squared. Okay. On the side, I'm gonna write the ones that are constants. 
Temperature is a constant. Everything in blue is constant. A, B, N, and R. Those are all constants. You guys ready? What this means in math, so I already told you what it means in the, in the real world. It's an instantaneous rate of change of pressure with respect to volume. In math, it means the derivative of P with respect to what? V. So I'm taking, so pretend the P is like a Y and the V is like an X. So I'm finding the rate of change of P with respect to uh, V. So here we go. DP over DV equals, what rule do I got to use for this one right here? Quotient, quotient, right? So that's a fraction there. So uh, I'm going to do quotient rule. Bottom, low D high, low D high minus high, I'm mean, sorry, low D high. So the derivative of the top. So the derivative of the top is N a constant, is R a constant, is T a constant. What's the derivative of a constant? Put zero. And make sure that you put in there somewhere that that's the derivative of that. Low D high minus high D low. So high D low. N and B are constants. Only V is the only thing that's changing. The derivative of V, that's like an X. The derivative of, of V by itself is just 1. All over bottom squared. Minus, that minus is this minus. Again, I'm doing quotient rule, bottom, times the derivative of the top. A and N are both constants, so the derivative of that is 0, minus top, times the derivative of the bottom. What's the derivative of V squared? That's like an X squared, 2V. And that is over bottom squared, so V squared squared is V to the 4th. Let's simplify. dp dv equals that time, anything times zero goes away. So I have negative nRT over parentheses v minus nb squared. This goes away, v squared times zero. Negative times a negative is a positive. I'm gonna cancel something out. I see one v here and I see, so that's gonna be a three now. So I see plus a n squared over v cubed. So there it is. If, if for some reason you are a grad student, oh yeah, the two still there. I would have gotten it wrong. If you're a grad student and you're for whatever reason you need this, well, you either got to get lucky that you hope a textbook has that. More than likely, no, because you're doing very specific work. Or you got to make sure you have the knowledge to create your own formulas. And now you're getting the knowledge to create your own formulas. Do you see how we did that, guys? No, you're going to remember this because we're going to keep going. Yeah, that's it. That's my formula. So now I can find my rate of change of P with respect to V as long as it's under these conditions where the temperature is constant, A, B, N, and R are constant. This is the, how you find the rate of change of pressure with respect to volume. All right, here we go. You guys ready? Let me zoom in. Y prime, derivative of one is zero. The derivative of X is one minus, what's the derivative of cosine? Yeah, yes, well, you're already giving me the answer, but negative, right? Negative times a negative is positive. There it is, guys. That's the first one. Number seven, rewrite it. We just talked about it a little while ago. One over x is the same thing as x to the negative one. I haven't taken a derivative yet, guys. Notice how I'm writing stuff. Those are equal. Now I'm typing, typing the derivative. Negative x to the negative two. Plus, that's just a constant. It's in front of the sign x. You do not have to do product rule. You can just leave it. Okay. Let, well, we're going to talk about it right now because there's a lot of people that have not learned the hard way there. What's the derivative of sine x? 
So that's five cosine x. So a lot of you are wondering, Chavez, but isn't that product like five times sine x? Yes, but you're forgetting. Remember when we did notes, uh, I want to say it was notes eight, maybe notes nine, and I said ddx of, so this is like a side note. There's a side note, guys. D dx of 3x squared. And didn't we say that you could just say 3 times, look, that's a constant, 3 times the derivative of x squared, which is just 2x, and we got 6x. Remember that? That's a side note. Now we don't do that because we're smart. We've been, we, we're experienced. You can just, you just know you can just go 3 times 2. It's the same thing with this. You can leave the 5 alone and just take the derivative of sine x. If you were to do product rule, do you get the same answer? Yes, you do. Don't write this down, just listen. Just listen, guys. If I were to do the derivative, so look, d dx of five sine x, and I'm gonna treat it like product rule, first and second. First, times the root of the second, the root of sine x is cosine x, plus second, sine x, the root of the first is zero, because the root of a, of a constant is, is zero. So there it is, this goes away. OMG, look at that, five cosine x. No matter what, you get the same thing as long as you know the concept. So now, from now on, if you have a constant in front of a trig, you can just leave the five alone, and then there it is. Cool or not cool? Virtual class, cool or not cool? Cool. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Number eight. Number eight, you are going to do product rule right there. Y prime equals that four doesn't have anything. Leave it alone. I'm going to move the minus right here in the front. Unless you want to pair it with the x squared, you can if you want to call that first. But I just wrote it here in the front, guys, to not confuse myself. So I'm going to do this. This is what I'm doing. See, I put the minus in the front, and I'm just going to do the derivative of the inside there. First, x squared times the derivative of the second. The derivative of sine x is cosine x. Plus the second, sine x times the derivative of the first, 2x. I'm going to distribute that negative. Y prime equals negative x squared cosine x minus 2x sine x. Done. Number nine, if you want to do quotient rule, you can. But notice, do I just have a constant in the numerator? Yeah. So if I just have a constant in the numerator, I can just bring that cosine up, and that's going to be 4 secant x. Does that make sense to everyone? One over cosine is secant. Side note. One over cosine x is secant x. So now it makes sense to you. Does that make sense now, Vienna? Okay. All right. So now I can just take the derivative. Y prime equals the derivative of secant x. Secant x tan x. Look, refer back to your notes from last one. Uh oh, now we have cotangents. Now we are forced to do quotient rule. Now we are forced to do quotient rule. By the way, side note, if you were to do quotient rule number nine, you would have gotten the same answer. You just had to have to do more steps. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna take a derivative. Y prime, bottom, low d high, one plus cotangent x times the derivative of the top. Do you guys remember the derivative of cotangent? Let's go slow. So do you remember the derivative of a tangent? It's going to be negative for sure. Negative what? Just cosecant? Squared. It's secant squared. So let me tell you what the, what the in-class group just said, guys, to keep you updated. They remember that the derivative, of a tan the derivative of a tan was secant squared. So then they said the derivative of a cotangent, well, first of all, it starts with a C, the derivative of cotangent. So cotangent starts with a C, so the derivative has to be negative. Anything that starts with a C, the derivative is negative. So they put a negative in the front. And then they were like, well, if the derivative of a tangent was secant squared, the only one that we haven't used is cosecant. So the derivative of a cotangent has to be negative cosecant squared. That makes sense? All right. So bottom times the derivative of the top minus top cotangent x times the derivative of the bottom. We get another negative cosecant squared all over the bottom squared. Hmm. I kind of want to factor out. 
a negative cosecant squared. What do you guys think? Should I leave it or just leave it for now because we're rookies? Okay. Do it. All right, let's do it. Here we go. I see this and I see this. I love they're both negative. Yeah, I can just factor it out because this is this is a term altogether, and that's a term altogether. You know what I mean? So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna write negative cosecant squared x, giant parenthesis, and I'm gonna be left with one plus cotangent x minus cotangent x. And look at that. One plus cotangent x squared. What happens to those cotangent x's? They zero out. No, you can say cancel out. It's technically the same, but I think the more proper wording is zero out. But yeah, you can say cancel out. They cancel out. So you just have negative cosecant squared over one plus cotangent x squared. And I think that's something, but we're gonna leave it like that. All right, let's go to the next one. Oh, this is my y prime, by the way. NC stands for no calculator. Find equations for the lines that are tangent and normal to the graph. So here we go, here's our pre-cal. And it's not even extreme pre-cal, it's just baby pre-cal. So first I need a point. What, okay, you know what? I should ask you guys, not just me say it. What two things do I need for a tangent line? Point and a slope. Get me a point first. When I plug in pi, what do I get? What is y of pi? Sine pi plus three. What is sine pi? Yeah, zero. So zero plus three is three. So baby pre-cal, not even extreme, just a little baby pre-cal there. Now I'm ready to take a derivative. Y prime equals, the derivative of sine x is cosine x. I'll plug in my pi to see what my slope is at pi, at pi. What is cosine of pi? One or negative one? Negative one. Remember, guys, that pi is right there on the unit circle. Oh, is she okay? That sounds like a screen. Okay. Good. All right. So, are we okay with this right here, guys? Yes. On the unit circle, pi is located right here. That is negative one zero. So, yeah, cosine of pi is negative one. So now that I know that, point slope form, y minus three equals negative parenthesis x minus pi. If you wanna leave it like that, that is okay with me. That is tangent. Okay. Uh, y minus three equals, uh, what's the opposite reciprocal of negative one? So you don't even need to put a parenthesis, you can just drop the parenthesis. There it is, there's my normal. All right, here we go. It says, which of the following defines the instantaneous rate of change of the function? I am forced to use, whoa, that's, that was scary. They're doing something with the announcements, guys. Um, what was that? Yeah, we have to do quotient rule, low to high minus high to low over low, low. So here we go, bottom, low to high, and then derivative of the top, what's the derivative of a sign? Minus top. Times rate of the bottom, the derivative of a sine is cosine t, and the derivative of a cosine is si uh, negative sine, but there's a negative there, so it's plus. And I tried to fill it all in there, guys, my, my bad. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's go ahead and write it over here. Let's see if we can write it better. I see that I can distribute this like that. Cosine t plus sine t from the derivative of the bottom. Oh yeah. Uh, here we go. Uh, sine t cosine t minus cosine squared t minus sine t cosine t minus sine squared t. All over sine t minus cosine t. Get up to here. What can I cancel out? 
or zero out. So sine t. So now I have negative cosine squared t minus sine squared t. And you can already see what I'm going to have to do over sine t minus cosine t. In the numerator, I'm going to factor out a what? Uh, a negative. No. No, I distribute. You know what I mean? It's. I don't see any errors. I think we are good. Cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to. That's a one. That's a one. Look for that answer. Oh, I just realized that we took over some of the work for 14. Don't worry, we're not going to need it. You feel what? Oh, but you're back. You got lost, but you found uh, no. Where did I lose you? No, it's not okay. No, ask. All I did was quotient rule. I did bottom times derivative of the top. So bottom, there's my sine t minus cosine t. Derivative of the top, the derivative of sine t is cosine t. Minus top sine t times the root of the bottom. The root of a sine is cosine. The root of a cosine is negative sine. But negative times a negative is a. Oh, I factored out the negative. Uh, see how I saw negative cosine squared minus sine squared? I immediately recognized that cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. And I said, hey, if I put, factor out a negative, I'm going to get that sucker to be 1. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, number 14. You do not have to do this by hand. You just got to look at it and recognize something. What is that telling me to do? I mean, I could do, I could do it by hand. We actually did the proof. Did we do this one? Yeah. This is actually on your notes, and that is the formal proof. Formal proof on notes. 10. That it's is the formal proof we did on notes 10. Where we did the double, we did, we needed to use the cosine a plus b. I could do that. I don't have enough space, but we could do that again. It is. How'd you know that? Tell me something else besides that. Oh. Um, you're, you're taking a derivative, the derivative of what? Cosine x. That's all you have to do, guys. You got you got to recognize that this is the derivative of cosine x. F of x is cosine x. So put in your notes. Recognize this is derivative. This is the derivative of cosine x. The derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. If you don't recognize that it's a derivative, then you would have to actually do the limit process. And it will take you a, bit, a little bit long, but you'll get it to negative sine x. All right, using the same logic. Look at number 15. You can, you can find it by doing the limit process, but recognize that this is, take, this is just taking a what? A derivative of what function? Perfect, square root of x. So I'm gonna say, write it in there for good notes, that number 15 is just taking a derivative of square root of x. And I'm going to wait for you guys to write that. Now that I know that I'm just taking the derivative of the square root of x, rewrite it, x to the half, and now I'm just going to solve. And I think we did this question earlier. 1 half x to the negative 1 half, bring that square root down, 1 over 2 x to the half, bring that, turn that half into a square root, and there it is. Okay, we're almost done. 
We get out of here at 2.15? Okay, we got enough time for these two, good. We're almost done. On um, questions like this, Viacana, do you see how I'm just dividing by one term there? If you want, you can do quotient rule, but you don't have to if it, if it makes life simpler to break it up. In this one, you can do quotient rule if you want. Because, okay, well, they want, find an equation on the tangent line. So you need two things. You need a point and a slope. So let's do it. Would you have done it with quotient rule? Okay, so let's do it that route first. First, let's get a point. One comma, one plus one is two, two divided by two is one. Did everyone get the point one, one? Okay, now let's do slope. So let's say we did quotient rule, and you guys will tell me which one's easier. So bottom, low D high, times the root of the top, minus top, high D low, times the root of the bottom, all over low, low. It, that's not hard. We, every, I think everyone can do that. I'm going to plug in a one right now. I'm not, I don't want to simplify. I just want to plug in a one right now. So I'm going to get two times three. So I'm going to get six minus, let's see, one plus one is two. Two times two is four. And then two times one is two and two squared is four. Did everyone get that like that? So two over four, so I get a half. You guys feel okay? All right, point slope form. Y minus one equals half. X minus one. I'm done. For now, I'm done. I'm going to call that the tangent. Okay. I'm going to wait for everyone to finish. Did I have to do quotient rule? You didn't have to if you felt that it's easier. I don't know. Maybe the quotient rule was easier. I could have done this. I could have just said this is just x cubed over 2x plus 1 over 2x. I could have said one of those x's cancel. Look, I haven't started it yet. Of course, you'd be a lot faster, right? Because I'm commenting here. So this would be one half x squared. I'm rewriting it. And then I'm going to rewrite this as plus one half x to the negative one. I'm rewriting it, guys. I'm bringing it up. I don't know if you can tell that I brought it up there. Maybe not with that one. I just brought it up to the side. So now look, derivative, y prime. Half of two or one half times two is just one. So that's just going to be x minus one half x to the negative two. Well, I don't know. They're both kind of the same, I think. They're both, both the red and the blue are kind of the same. Y prime of one, one minus a half. Well, look, you get the same thing, half. Negative half. Uh, no, it's positive. This is one minus a half. One minus 0.5. They're both, I feel like they both are the same. I don't think there's one easier than the other. Uh, do you feel the blue one's easier or the red one? They're both the same, guys. But I just wanted to let you know that if it's just one term like that, you don't, you're not forced to do quotient. You can do other stuff as long as the correct math is the correct math. That makes sense? Okay. Last one. This one, there's more than one term in the bottom. You're forced. You can't do anything else. You have to do what rule? Quotient. Lodi high, bottom times rid of the top, minus high D low, top times rid of the bottom, all over low low. I'm going to distribute the four. Let's see, eight uh, X plus four. And then look, don't forget the negative out here, guys. I guess I'll do this first and then distribute the negative. Two times four, that's gonna be eight X, but don't forget the negative, minus eight X. And then two times three, that's minus six, but then with the negative, we're gonna turn to plus six. I see the eight X's are gonna zero out. And then I see four and six equals 10. And there it is. How do we feel? All right, guys. All right, class. Let's come back.